This episode is sponsored by Linode. Linode is offering listeners of this podcast a $20 credit, which is good for four free months at their lowest plan. Their plans start at one gigabyte of RAM for $5 a month. You can get your servers in any of their 10 data centers, and their high memory plans start at 16 gigabytes. Get a server running in under a minute. They do hourly billing with a monthly cap on all plans and add-on services like backups, node balancers, long view, etc. VMs for full control, running Docker containers, encrypted disks, VPNs, etc. You can run a private Git server. They provide native SSD storage, 200 gigabit network, and Intel E5 processors. They have 24-7 friendly support, even on holidays, and a seven-day money-back guaranteed. So go check them out at linode.com slash JavaScript Jabber. Hey, everybody, and welcome to another episode of JavaScript Jabber. This week on our panel, we have Joe Eames. Hey, everybody. Corey House. Hello from Kansas City. Amy Knight. Hello from Nashville. I'm Charles Maxwood from devchat.tv. Uh, just a quick shout out. Uh, about the React and Vue podcasts that we're pulling together. I have Indiegogo's up for those as these come out. So please go support them. Uh, we also have a special guest this week, and that's Ryan Glover. Ryan, you want to say hi? Howdy from Chicago. So uh, we had a chat a while back. Somebody recommended that you come on um, my JavaScript story. And so we wound up talking about JavaScript and entrepreneurship. And... It's funny because I, I talk to people on a regular basis uh, who listen to the show, and one of the things that comes up somewhat uh, regularly is just the idea of how do I start a business, or um, you know, what do I need to know as a developer to start a business, or I'm not really good at businessy stuff. So, yeah. anyway, I'm I'm kind of curious. What what do you tell people just to kind of get them started? Oh, uh, strap in. Because <laughs> uh, awesome. uh, I, I think there's this this uh, notion that doing this stuff, there's like a really clear path to figuring it out. And if you follow these, you know, three or five steps, you're going to magically become a millionaire or, or figure it out. And that is far from the truth. Um, and so I say that jokingly, hey, um, but I also mean it. So so, yeah. So let's uh, let's back up a minute and have you introduce yourself. Yeah. So my name is Ryan Glover. Uh I run a small company based out of Chicago, Illinois, called Clever Beagle. Uh, it's concentrated on helping first-time developers to ship a software product. So these are people who, who understand how software development works from the perspective of the, the nuts and bolts. So they understand HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, uh, but they've never really organized that all together into a functioning product and actually shipped it to customers. So... Uh, that's what I do. I, I teach people how to actually go through the process of taking their idea and implementing it so that people can actually use it and pay them money for it. Is this something that you just started doing or is this something um, that you like came up with the idea after like the boot camp craze? Ooh, very good question. <laughs> um, so the, the company itself started six months ago, um, but the actual idea has been in action for a while. So I run another business called The Meteor Chef. Uh, which is a tutorial website where I teach people how to use the Meteor JavaScript framework. Um, and out of that, I'd say it was about two years ago, uh, random people started to ask me, hey, can you help me with my projects? Can you, you know, give me a quick code review and things like that? And I started to notice a lot of patterns in people asking for that type of service. So just sit down and mentor me for a few hours. Nothing you know, consistent, not contract work or anything like that, but just, hey, I need a, another pair of eyes to look at my code. Uh, and so about two years ago, under uh, the Meteor Chef, we started a mentorship service under there uh, that was solely focused on Meteor. Uh, and then that ran for about a year and a half, and I started to notice a lot of patterns in the ways that uh, people were were working with us. So originally, it was just, bring us a to-do list, and we'll will help you to knock out those problems in your Meteor application. But it slowly evolved into having quite a few customers who had come to us uh, trying to build a product. So we would meet regularly, you know, every week or every other week uh, to build their product. And out of that uh, came the idea for Clever Beagle and the, the service that we're running today. So, um, and, you, and you made an interesting point there. Did it come out of the, uh, what did you say, the boot camp craze? Yeah, because I find like a lot of people, um, I, I don't know, maybe like 30 percent ish of people who go into boot camps are doing it because they have a product in the back of their mind that they want to build. 
And I wonder if something like this is a better bet for them. Got it. Um, I think that comes down to the individual and what they're they're ultimately trying to accomplish. But um, I would say you're definitely going to get a more hands-on approach with us because it's it's just you and uh, right now there's just two mentors. It's myself and one other guy who's based out of England. His name's Matt Michelle. Um, but it's, it's one-on-one. -on -one, so it's a direct relationship. You're not in a classroom and you're not having to, to compete for attention of the teacher. It's literally someone who's gone through the process of building and shipping a product before sitting down with you and coaching you one-on-one -on -one each week. Well, and you said that you, you're oriented around people who already have skills, right? And about helping them get a product launch where boot camps are more for people without skills, right? Correct. Yeah. So, so I'm curious because I think a lot of a, I, I think Amy's right. I think a lot of people learn to code because they have something they want to build. I also uh, see a lot of people they they kind of get to the point where okay, I've worked for enough schmucks that I can't stand. I want to <laughs> start my own thing, or they get going and they realize that they have an idea that they could go and run with. So, where where are people getting stuck? Because we have the technical skills to pull this out. But there's there's other stuff to it. And so once I have my thing built, all of a sudden I'm hitting roadblocks. What are those roadblocks? Man, the biggest one is fear. Uh, so it's it's the, the unknowns and the what ifs. And um, I, I had a conversation over the summer. I spoke at a conference called Midwest JS out in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Um, and I, I grabbed lunch with a developer who is familiar with my work. And while we were talking, he, he kept asking me, you know, how, how do you do this? How do you get started? And the truth is you just have to start. And a lot of people seem to have just a mental roadblock about, well, well, what if my customers don't like my product or what if nobody shows up or what if this, and it's, it's not so much that they don't have the technical aptitude to execute on the idea. It's the it's more like psychological and emotional. It's just stopping yourself from just sitting down and doing the work and following through to the end, um, which is really the biggest problem that I see is, OK, even if I get started, you know, a lot of people will just start spinning their tires. Uh, you know, maybe it's they hear that there's some new JavaScript framework they have to use and that happens every week. So they start switching their platform every week or they, you know, uh, they sit down and write a detailed business plan. but then do nothing about it. And really that's it. It's, it's, it's one of those things that's really simple, but not easy. Uh, but yeah, that's, that's where I see a lot of people getting stuck. Isn't that they don't know how to do it. It's just that they don't have the, the drive. I, and I'm, I'm hesitant to say that they don't have the motivation. Um, but it's just the, the ability to look past the fear and step into the unknown and just do it and see what happens. All right. So I want to chip in here. I think I've seen a very common uh, thing that happens with people uh, that are developers, right? Like my development friends, even myself. I think I've got the skill set. I've got this idea for a product, right? And then one of two things happens. Either they go off and they build it and they just build the product. And then they think, they think well, that's it. I built the product. I should be good. Or they just never start building it they constantly talk about the fact that they've got this great idea but they never start building it so in the other case the, the case of i built it or i've got this thing i built this software that's all i need right yeah exactly and that's the thing it's so much more than just getting it built like the and, and you're kind of alluding to this too which is the real work actually starts after you've built it and shipped it not before all of the you know I would say on average, it takes most folks about three to six months to get their first version done. And it feels like, oh, man, I just did all that work. That was so much time and trouble. But no, the second that that thing goes live, you got to hit the ground running and you got to start having a strategy for marketing. And if it's actually successful and you start getting customers, you got to start doing customer support. So it's there's a lot to it. You can't just, you know, have an idea and then implement it. You also have to if you're serious, I should say, about running a business, you have to run the business. You can't just expect it to, you know, you flip a power switch on and then it takes care of itself. Boy, I've learned that one the hard way. Why is that? Uh, well, um, so, for example, the the podcast, they kind of started out as a hobby. And, and so I had the podcast and I was out there and 
you know, eventually mm-hmm. things got to the point where I didn't have time to do consulting and podcasting. And so I went full time on the podcasting, but it was still kind of a hobby. And so I'd go through these air, these times of like major drought because I wasn't doing the business stuff. I was just uh, doing whatever I wanted and producing the podcast at the same time. And so, you know, I wouldn't go out and find sponsors or things that, that would pay the bills so that I could continue to do what I was doing. And so then I'd have to scramble all of this stuff. And, uh, you know, it, it, it kind of sucks when you're sitting there going, well, I'm having so much fun doing this. And then you realize, oh, well, um, I have to go run the business too. You know, I have to go do the marketing. I have to go do the sales. I have to go uh, do the support. I have to do all of the other things that are the less fun part of doing what you do. Yeah, absolutely. And there's, you know, I think it's, it, it can sound kind of mean or condescending, but this is kind of like, well, like how real life is. It's survival mm-hmm. of the fittest. And I think some people just don't have it in them. Maybe that like, again, they have the technical skills, they have the wherewithal to do it, but whatever that thing is, you know, this intangible thing, they just don't have it. And I think that's what separates the the stuff that actually sees the light of day from the stuff that just, you know, sits in a folder on your hard drive somewhere and you're the only person that knows about it. Yeah. One thing, though, that I have seen is that a lot of times you can find people that have the skills that you lack. So you find you figure out, OK, you know, I, I, I'm not good at the marketing or I don't want it. I don't care about being good at the marketing. So you go mm-hmm. find a business partner or you go hire somebody to do that. Um, I'm I'm curious, though, a lot of people hesitate to do that because they don't want to give up a chunk of their baby or they don't want to, uh, you know, they don't want to pay out for that stuff if they can figure out how to do it themselves. At what point do you start looking at either hiring or bringing on some kind of business partner or associate? I mean, the the age old advice is hire before you're ready. Um and and speaking personally, the you know I've just started to hire people after, I mean in one way or another I've been trying to find a viable business and build a business over about the last six years, and honestly it, it just comes down to when do you feel like you're about to absolutely lose your marbles? Uh, you just got to say like okay I may not have enough cash in the bank or I may not think I have enough cash in the bank, uh, but you just have to like pick somebody. Um, and I, and you know, my personal recommendation is someone who's close to you, either you've worked with them before they're a buddy or something like that, but, uh, you just have to, to pull the trigger and do it. There's no specific time when you do it. It's not like you're going to see like, a you know, uh, the bat symbol in the sky and be like, okay, now's the time. It's, you just, you have to make a conscious decision to say, okay, I want to go from where I'm at now. And I've clearly thought about how adding another person will help me to go to whatever that next level or that next plateau is. Yeah, that makes sense. And for me, you know, I, I've had that struggle as well. And essentially, when I added team members was, yeah, when when I couldn't do it anymore, when I felt like it was limiting my business to not have those people in the business, as, as mm-hmm. opposed to when I necessarily felt like I could afford them, because there was no way I could continue doing it the way I was doing it. Yeah, absolutely, man. It's it, it's honestly you can never afford people. Um, at least that's the way I felt. Like there's always going to be a hidden cost to it. There's always something. It depends on how you hire people. Like so, a lot of my hires have been contract workers. So it's just people like one off, or we'll set up a deal and say, okay, let's work together for three to six months or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's that's kind of the the nice way to dip your toes into the pool of it because you're not you know, having to make serious commitments because the the point where it gets scary is when you start to say, okay, this person has kids and I'm their full-time salary and, you know, potentially their benefits and stuff like that. That's when it gets kind of spooky. And I personally haven't jumped into that yet, but I I don't know. I feel like you don't have to go that far to get the help that you need. Uh, You can do it on a much smaller scale to start and then, uh, you know, scale up from there depending on the amount of work that you have coming in. One other thing that I I get asked fairly frequently, and I don't know if I have a good answer for this, is how do I know if my idea is going to work in the first place? You don't. (laughs) Um, Oh, come on. That can be heartbreaking. (laughs) No, I'm serious. You know, everybody wants like a a magic 
solution or a, a wave of the wand. It's it's true. The the honest thing is that you just have to you have to basically be able to identify what and it's it's all it's the the scientific method. So you have you start with a hypothesis of okay, well I think this is a problem that people have and. Typically, the best way to confirm that is not to just, you know, go off a hunch and then waste six months of your life trying to build something. It's just go talk to people and say, like, is this a problem that you have and watch how they they respond to that. Um, and I think that's. That's the only way to really do it. You're never you're never going to know. And I mean, if you think about it, major companies think about this, like major, major companies have put years into projects for them to end up being a total flop. Uh, and there, there was one that really shocked me recently. I didn't know about this, but I, I found this, this book, uh, called, uh, brick by brick. And it's about the Lego company. Um, and specifically it was about the Lego company around the, the beginning of 2000, um, and how the company was about to just go away. They were about to completely go into bankruptcy because they had bet on a lot of ideas that they thought were, they're a sure thing. Like this is going to work. Kids are going to love this. And it didn't, and it almost tanked the company. And these are this is a company that's been around since. Oh, I'm probably gonna get this wrong, but like the 30s or 40s. Uh, and so, if that doesn't tell you that hey, nobody has a magic recipe, I don't know what does. And this this isn't just that one company. This is tons of companies. You see it constantly, and major companies like, uh, gee, IBM, Kodak, these companies that were like considered blue chip stocks back in the 80s and 90s. Where are they today? Yeah. And it's, it's not, it's just not magic. You have to really put in the effort and you also have to just understand that just because one idea didn't work doesn't mean that the next one won't. You just have to have that drive and determination to say like, okay, well, I tested this idea. It didn't work. And instead of getting, you know, upset and cranky about it, you got to say like, well, why didn't it work? And start to dissect like, was it the, the idea just wasn't actually solving a problem or was it that the execution of the idea didn't really solve the problem, meaning the idea was fantastic, but the way that I executed on it or implemented it just kind of sucked and nobody liked how I did it. Uh, but there's, man, yeah, there's, there's just no recipe. It doesn't exist. Hopefully that's not too heartbreaking no. of news. <laughs> I, I like so I it. Find that, uh, I find that advice uh, particularly interesting. Right now I'm uh, reading a book called The 50th Law which tells the story of 50 Cent, the rapper. And one, one thing that he emphasizes is uh, having multiple lines of business at the same time, effectively placing a lot of bets. And that way uh, you can afford for a few things not to pan out uh, because early on what he was doing was putting all of his effort into a single area. And when that fell flat, he was stuck and he didn't have any resources to go elsewhere. Um, so yeah. I, I think your point is interesting, but uh, any entrepreneur deals with this of uh, sort of these conflicting ideas where people say you've got to go big on one thing, but on the same time, at the same time, recognizing that you also need to uh, have uh, m place multiple bets. And that may mean doing a few things at the same time until you found the one thing that really works. And once you found that one thing, that's the point when it probably makes more sense to shift gears and go all in on that item. Is that something that you advise people to do? Is that a, a mindset that you've seen work? Uh, yes and no. If, if you're going to, I would say if you're going to take that mindset, you better be prepared to be in this long term. And I'm not just talking a few months, a few years, I'm talking decades. Uh, because to build an actual portfolio of businesses and to have the wherewithal to manage a portfolio of businesses takes a lot of effort and a lot of knowledge and a lot of experience. Uh, it's not something where you're just like, okay, I'm going to start three businesses at the exact same time and make them work. You have to make one work and then you have to take what you learned from that first one and then apply it to the others. So I would, I would bet, and I'd be curious in that book if, uh, he explains that at all. Does he suggest, um, building up to that point or was it just like he decided, okay, I'm going to run three businesses and it worked. Well, the book is fascinating because it's it's also uh, so jarring. I mean, 50 Cent early on was dealing crack uh, on the street, and he talks about diversifying there and how he got away from having to fill bags by uh, teaching people how to fill capsules partially full but make them look full, and then they gave him the extra crack and was able to sell it. So this has very uh, 
interest. This is a very interesting story compared to what people would normally do in business, mm-hmm. but the parallels there uh, are compelling nonetheless. I mean, I, I think the reason that this resonated with me is uh, I've, I've been entrepreneurial for, for years, although I've had a full-time job my entire career. I have always had a side hustle, uh, at least one or two. And today I, I do consulting uh, in React. I get paid for that. I speak at conferences, sometimes get paid for that, use that to travel around and promote. I uh, author courses. So all of those are businesses that I do. And um, although very clearly, one of the things that I do on the side makes much, much more money for me and is much more successful than the others. I keep those other things around, those other businesses around because I see them as related. I see them as helping spin the flywheel that, for instance, speaking at a conference helps increase the chances that I'll get to do more consulting, helps spread the word for uh, courses and those sorts of things. So I think the tricky thing about telling people to go all in on, on one business idea is recognizing that you may have multiple uh, sources of income and all those income sources of income hopefully are related where you can maybe take a piece of work and package it in multiple ways. Uh, so like yes. for software developers, you talk about, hey, I could I could write this blog post, but that means I could also submit to this conference and get my product idea in front of these other people. And I could also use that blog post as part of my documentation. I could use that to create a video, et cetera. Well, Corey, in that case, aren't you really talking about basically what you're doing is marketing for one or two different businesses, right? It's really one or two core activities, the consulting, and then I guess the courses and everything else is really marketing for that. Well, I, I would agree with you, except for the fact that those other marketing channels are also revenue streams. Uh, I mean, speaking at some point goes from being a marketing channel to actually being a revenue stream, because what you realize is people start paying you to do that instead. So you stop speaking for free and start speaking for money. Um, and that, that takes a long time to get there, but it is something that, that's certainly uh, attainable for people. Um, so uh, that that's where I think it gets a little bit cloudy. Uh, I, and I think that there's a really good book by uh, John Acuff called Quitter uh, that, that I read a couple years ago because everybody romanticizes this idea of being a full-time entrepreneur, but uh, there's a recognition that many people have full-time jobs that create a synergy with their side hustle. And uh, that's absolutely why I keep my full-time job is everything I do at my full-time job also helps me author, helps me speak, helps me do consulting. So they, they absolutely uh, complement one another. So uh, I, I guess I'm, I'm also curious, um, what advice do you give people that, that come to you and say, hey, I've got this business, but when do I quit? Whenever it makes sense to you. Uh, because what the, the thing that, that I've seen a lot of folks get stuck on is feeling like there's, there's a panacea for this stuff where it's like, okay, what did that guy do? How did he run his life? It, you can't do it that way. You can't think about it that way. You got to do it contextually mm-hmm. to yourself in your own life. So it's like, you know, I, I meet a lot of guys who are like on the verge of quitting a job, but they have three kids at home and no cash in the bank. And it's like, I obviously I'm like, no, don't do that. <laughs> um, yeah. But that's the thing. It's that you, you'll know when you're making a really dumb decision and a really, or a really smart decision or just something kind of in the middle where it's like, that's risky, but you know, I have enough money in the bank and, and a, one of those um, oh, like general general pieces of advice that you'll hear is you, you should have six to 12 months of cash in the bank before you quit anything. Um, but that advice is contextual. So like if you have kids, yeah, you better have six to 12 months of cash in the bank. Um, for example, myself, when I first started, I'll never forget this. It was terrifying. Um, I had $500 in the bank uh, it was halfway through the month. My rent was due in about two weeks and my rent was $900 that month. Um, and I had no jobs lined up. Uh, and I got real lucky to find a freelance gig to get me to the next part and get me past that. But that was a really terrible idea. So in retrospect, I would say, you know, you gotta, you gotta know what it takes to run your, well, yeah, that's the best way to think about it. You gotta know what it takes for you to survive realistically. So like, what are your bills? What are your expenses? And then add, you know, maybe 10 to 15% to that. And if you're confident that you can make that with whatever venture you're doing, whether it already exists or it's something that you're starting and your confidence going to take off, then go nuts. But anything before that, you're really, 
place in a bet. So you have to know the the consequences of that. Um, you you know, I've I've seen guys, you know, like get kind of on the edge of divorce and things like that because they made the wrong bet. So you really have to know. Can I do this and am I going to do it? Because if you make that decision, you can't just say, OK, well, I'm going to start my own business and then, you know, pick my nose and watch YouTube all day. You got to be working. And if you're committed and you're ready to do that mentally, like you're at that point, then go for it. Um, but if you're yep. not, you don't have the cash, then I'd be cautious. Yep. You got a time box nose picking. Um Small amount of time. <laughs> That's got to be a great quote for this show. <laughs> In a time box. But I, I think I think it's interesting too because uh, you know for some people you know you mentioned you know some folks they have like three kids at home and you know so it's just it's it's a bad time to not have income. But I know other people that have been in a position where um, you know they didn't have kids or they you know they and their spouse were totally okay with. Um, you know, mom, mom had a, a pull out couch that they could crash on for a little while. And so they went and did their side venture and essentially made it their full-time venture because they had some sort of backup or support and they made it work. But if you're not one of those people, then I completely agree. You know, you, you have to keep that in mind, uh, cause the last thing you need is to be stressed over whether or not you can put food on the table for, for kids or a spouse or whatever. Yeah, absolutely. So, Amy, did you have a question? I did, but looking at your site, I'm thinking that this isn't really included. Do you ever get into, um, like, mentorship on helping people find funding? Uh, no, we actually okay. haven't crossed that bridge yet. Okay, yeah, looking at your site, I didn't think so. So, <laughs> no, it's it's very much a indie operation. Like my my favorite people are you know people with a this will sound cheesy, but like people with a dream or an idea that they really love and they want to try and build it. You know, we, we can't guarantee that working with us is going to make the resulting business that we build together a success. You know, the only thing I can really guarantee or really promise to anybody is that as long as you're willing and able to put in the time and effort to build something, I can help you get the idea built and shipped into production. But up until that point or after that point, um, for the most part, it's on you. We, we're happy to give advice and things like that. But yeah, it's it's on you. Um, but yeah, we, we haven't gotten into financing or anything like that yet. So can you share how you uh, learned what you know about entrepreneurship? Do you run your own freelance business? Or maybe you're thinking about picking up some business on the side. Well, then you need FreshBooks. FreshBooks is the quickest and easiest way to get invoices out to your clients. It's easy to use. It works anywhere, available from any device, uh, on the desktop, iPhone, iPad, Android, and all of your data is backed up and secure. And it makes it really easy to get organized and get paid. You'll be tracking time, logging expenses, and invoicing your clients in no time. You can also save time billing, freeing up several days per month to focus on the work that you love, and you get paid faster. FreshBooks customers are paid on average five days faster because there's a link on the invoice that says pay me now. And it's a great way to grow your business. Plus, FreshBooks is offering a 30-day trial. That's right, 30-day trial if you try them out. So go to gofreshbooks.com slash devchat and enter devchat in the how did you hear about us section. Once again, for a 30-day trial, go to gofreshbooks.com slash devchat and enter devchat in the how did you hear about us section. Hmm, I can. Um... <laughs> well, it's you. such you a big every... no. <laughs> find wall bang no, it's head just such a big question. yeah i'll just slam my head on the wall here um honestly the the way i learned it is making a lot of mistakes uh and just not it, you yeah being okay so three things uh making mistakes being fearless and reading about the mistakes and successes of other people um, one of the, one of the biggest pieces of advice I can give to anybody doing this stuff is to be an absolutely voracious reader, um, and study because there are people in our industry, outside of our industry, you know, 
poets, musicians, like all of these people who have gone through the, the trials and tribulations of trying to do anything creative, whether that be a business or releasing uh, an album or, you know, painting, you know, some magnificent painting, whatever you want to call it. There, there's so much knowledge out there that you can learn from. And it's, it's really silly to not take that in. And honestly, that's been the thing that's helped me the most is just kind of following my nose and starting like, okay, um, a good example is somebody, what is his name? Uh, Derek Sivers. Uh, so he's a, an entrepreneur. He started a company called CD baby, uh, back around, it was 98, 99. Mm -hmm. He was running the company, uh, and ended up selling it for some multiplier of millions of dollars. Um, but his big thing is, um, when people ask him for advice, he always says, uh, you know, go out and read books. And he, he posts his book notes online so that you go, go through them. And I highly recommend reading that. And he was my starting point. I, I can't remember how I came across the guy, but I'm glad I did because I heard that piece of advice had to be an interview or something like that. Um, and then I started looking at his reading list and I just, he had a, a sort button where you could say sort by the most popular or my, my favorites or something like that. And I just started going down the list and slowly you start to develop a rabbit hole. It's like, Oh, this author recommended this author. And you can start to see how people came to the ideas that they had. And you almost immediately start to develop an aptitude for how business works because you're seeing like, Oh, well, they made that decision at that point in time. Okay. That, that starts to make sense. Um, but that's really where it comes from. There's, I'm hesitant to say that, you know, there's some specific school you can go to where they're magically going to tell you how to do this. I think a lot of it is experiential and you just have to, you have to learn it yourself, but also learn from others. There's not a single book, I guess you can pick up and have it figured out in a day. Mm -hmm. So I was going to ask a question, but my follow-up is, but I didn't ask it since we don't get into, you know, funding, but this is kind of like a follow-up question to that, which maybe touches on what I wanted to get into was like challenges for women. But so how much of this is really just like luck and privilege? Luck and privilege. Um, I would say a good, uh, a hefty amount of it is luck. Um, about 80% luck, definitely. I think. <laughs> that, wow. 80%. I, I would say 50%. Okay. Um, if only because the, the things that I've gotten, uh, or the, the success that I've found, we'll say it that way, um, uh, has been solely through sitting down and doing the work. Um, some of the, the sure. deals and experiences and opportunities I've gotten out of that are pure luck. I, I couldn't have, there have been points where I've been completely like on the edge of quitting and then I'll get an email and somebody's like, hey, you want to work on this project? Or, hey, can I be your customer? And you're just like, oh, OK, thank you. Um, so that's why I say it's like you have to, to really drive it. So it's about 50 percent you, 50 percent luck. And then kind of I would say to, to speak to privilege, um, to some extent, I, I think that can be a misnomer depending on how you're you're defining privilege. Can you define it for me? Um. Well, I mean, <sighs> You know, like Cora was talking about, like 50 Cent, like, you know, people who maybe, you know, they didn't have the opportunity to, they have to take out like hefty student loans to go to college or, you know, they didn't go to a great high school or, or that kind of thing. Got it. Um, I mean, you can factor that in, but that's really. Um... I, I, I would like factor that in with, it, it is kind of luck, bless, blessing, whatever you want to call it. So i I don't know. To me, they're kind of like one in the same, but I don't yeah, know. I, I mean, mean there are a lot of people out there that have been in, come out of terrible places, you know, with not a lot of opportunity and have made a lot out of it. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. But that's that's not that's not in evidence that it's just as easy to do that. Like, no, I read oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> that, yeah, that's not what I said, that... but. Hold on, hold on. I want to. I want to. I want to relate a very interesting study I read I by. I want to say um, something too. <laughs> in this book, I was reading the, the Big Data book. They were talking about um, this uh, common perception that in the NBA, you know, NBA is uh, 
majority uh, are African Americans, right? Of the, of the players, right? And so there's a common perception that's the way that, like, a lot of these African American players are these poor kids growing up on the mean streets of Chicago or you know Harlem, just playing in the, uh, you know, they're they're in the worst possible steps and basketball was their only way out. Right. And that was true for, I think LeBron James had a fairly similar story to that, but he was trying to, this guy decided he wanted to study that and figure out how many of the people, you know, these African-Americans specifically came from actually very middle-class backgrounds versus lower class backgrounds. And he, he used a lot of different ways to try to figure it out. He he studied to see if any of them actually said if they they, they did and use that. But he used some other things like their first name, for example. Your first name indicates a lot as to what your socioeconomic background is. Anyway, he determined that by far the vast majority of these people come from middle class and upper middle class. These African-Americans that are playing the NBA come from the upper middle class. So the idea that, hey, this is the place where all these really, really, really poor kids are breaking out and, you know, making their riches is just not not true that's interesting so the the thing i wanted to say maybe i can find it to put in the show notes but um like we all know this but it was a good visualization of it so somebody on facebook maybe a week or so ago posted this video um it was like all these high school kids and they're all standing out in a field and they're they start off like and and maybe people have seen this they start off like all he places like a hundred dollar bill or something in the grass and they all start off like, you know, the same distance oh, from the hundred dollar yeah, bill. Yeah. And he tells people, you know, like take two steps back. If, you know, you grew up in a family where your parents were divorced, take two steps back. If you grew up in a family where, um, you know, you didn't have a father or you had to take out loans or, or stuff like that, or take two steps forward. If you had like, you know, the opportunity to go to college and, and, you know, your parents paid for it or stuff like that. So, um, it was, it was very, it was a very moving video. I thought it was like five minutes long or something. You're going to put a link to that in the show notes, right? I'm going to try to find it. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And, and I just want to chime in here. I, I don't discount any of that, but I, I also wonder to what extent it comes down to your socioeconomic background and how much it comes down to how that socioeconomic background affects your mindset. And I think I think there you go. I think there's some of both. I think I think that's really what I'm trying to say. So in some cases, you feel like you don't have the opportunities. And in some cases, you actually don't have the opportunities. And so. so- what, where are you getting stuck? Like, which one is it? And, hey. you know, can you work your way through it and out of it? So, so something very interesting when I was, I was, I was talking about this study that I was reading about the NBA players, the uh, guy said that one of the things that people may not realize is how much difference have growing up in a stable home might have on your ability to achieve. And he gave a, uh, a one specific example of one person, and it was a very promising basketball player who everybody thought was just going to be the next phenom. But he kept he kept getting kicked off of teams because he kept having struggles with his other teammates and his coach, and he just couldn't relate. He couldn't deal with the stresses, and he he was always reacting in violence and getting in fights and stuff. And he grew up from a very, in a very broken home, and so he showed that as an example of a way that hey, growing up in an upper middle class or middle-class environment with a more stable environment gives you an advantage over somebody growing up in a lower socioeconomic stat, uh, environment where typically you might have a rougher background. Yeah, I think that's fair. I, I think we can come up with anecdotes either way. It's interesting that the, the data indicates, as you said, you know, that a lot of this it does come out of, you know, being in a certain e- uh, economic status. Um, but again, you know, I mean, I grew up being told that I was going to go to college. I grew up being told that I, I, you know, I was expected to, you know, live a certain kind of life. And so that's kind of the direction I took. And my parents didn't pay for college or anything either. And so, you know, some of it, I think, is actual privilege, like we talk about. And I think some of it is just that, you know, it it was never, for me, mentally an option to not go to college. And, you know, and I think I think both of those things play in. I don't I don't think you can blame it all on one or the other. Well, see, but that's the thing, the blame word, because I feel like, and I, speaking to that, that video that Amy was talking about, the thing that bothers me about a lot of the conversations around privilege and all that stuff is that it, it's almost framed from the perspective of you should be guilty because you, you got a, a start in life. Like nobody really chooses where they're born, the life that they're born into, nobody. Um, you can only operate within the parameters that you're given. Um, and I think a lot of the conversations that are going on just in society as a whole today 
are kind of framed from, well, this guy got something that I didn't. And, or this person, you know, had, you know, their parents invested in their business or this person did that. And it it gets people into this cycle of not focusing on just getting themselves out of wherever they are. And Chuck, you just said this, it's, it's mindset. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I can't like, I had a a, a very nice childhood. I, I got very lucky. I had great parents. Um, and I also was around very talented people in my life. A lot of my, my family members, very talented. Um, so I got to grow up around that kind of environment. But at the same time, you know, my father grew up in Detroit and half of my family is from Detroit and the impoverished side of Detroit. So I got a real interesting kind of dichotomy growing up of, you know, people who are living pretty close to the, the poverty line, if not at or under it, as well as, you know, my 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 mother's side of the family was, uh, you know, basically dynasty, um, they, you know, a bunch of, of rich white folks. Um, uh, and seeing those, those two sides of it, I'm going to ask you guys a question because it might shock you. Where do you think the two families ended up? So you had the, the family that grew up in Detroit close to the poverty line and the family that grew up in absolute utter wealth. Where do you think they are today? Not in Chicago. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's funny because this almost exactly mirrors my except for the dynasty part but yeah my family's very much the same except oh, yeah. and my, I, mean, I mean my dad he grew up uh picking onions to buy school clothes when he was like 6 you know and and my my mom grew up well off cuz her father was an engineer but he grew up on a poor farm in Canada and yeah anyway it's it's really interesting the dynamic because yeah my my mom who grew up with you know money essentially her brothers and sisters of some of them have really screwed up their lives. And my dad's family, they're all nurses and, and doctors and stuff because they didn't want to live that way anymore. Right. And that's the exact same outcome. But in my own story is people who had intense wealth didn't know the, the ability to work themselves out of a situation. And when the money ran out, their lives fell apart. Yeah, the, the, the thing that bothers me most about the conversations about privilege really come down to not whether or not you're going to make somebody feel guilty for having it. It's whether you're going to discourage somebody by telling them they don't. That's that's the thing that really bothers me about most of the conversations that boil down to privilege is you're mm-hmm. not an X and so you can't X. And I I, I see that that's patently untrue. Um, you know, people have capacity and they usually just get in their own way by the way, you know, the way that they think about things. And, you know, there, there's nothing special about being white or not white or a woman or a man. It's, it's how much of your mindset uh, stops you from achieving. And if you start telling people that they don't have privilege and that's why they're not going to succeed, then they're not going to look for the ways to get out of their own way and, and succeed. And that's not to say that some people grew up in places that are just so broken that they just, you know, it's going to take colossal effort for them to change the way that they think and change their circumstances enough to find opportunities. Um, because I think there are people in those situations too. But I think there are some people that wind up somewhere on the bubble that get told they don't have privilege and they give up. And I think that's a, a tragedy. For sure. Absolutely. I didn't mean to derail us. I think that just to like sum up the point of that video in case people don't get a chance to watch it is um, he just closes a video by like if, if you are blessed in some manner, whether it be like financial or, or, or who knows, like emotionally, something like that, um, you know, try to help people who aren't blessed in that way. Yeah, absolutely. And that's absolutely the truth. I think that's right. a good point to make. And it's also that a video, the idea of, hey, the hundred dollar bills in the, in the center. It's a little bit of a problem because simply because life is not a zero sum game. Right. Mm-hmm. The reality is, is, as more people succeed, that increases the chance that you will succeed as well. Right. There's not a limited fixed quantity of cash and value. And I mean, there is of cash, but not of value. Right. So um, one of the things we can we could do is like what Amy said, look at it as an opportunity and realize the, the uh, privilege that you've got and the opportunity you have to bless other other lives. But also. Don't get discouraged, as Chuck was saying, because just because somebody else is succeeding, that doesn't decrease your chances of succeeding. It pretty much increases your chances of succeeding in all cases. Yep. 
Yeah. Can we say, I, okay. So for your, for the audience, I don't know if you have like a lot of younger folks listening to this, but if you do and they're listening, go do whatever you want. It may not always be easy. It's going to suck sometimes more often than not, but just keep going and keep doing what you want to do. No matter what, don't let any outside third party noise, follow your heart and just do what you want to do and push your ideas forward and just do it because there's a lot of people out in the world that will tell you, don't do it, do it, you know, hold you back, not hold you back. It doesn't matter. Just go do what you want to do and ignore the rest. Um, okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I would, I would chime in on the end of that, that, uh, an interesting anecdote of this is there's been multiple decisions that I've made in my career that my parents suggested not doing because it was risky. And often the people that are closest to you will advise you not to do risky things out of a genuine sense of concern about how it could work out for you. But you have to recognize that you are in a unique position of being able to determine the amount of risk that you're taking on. Mm -hmm. And that often your, your parents are going to choose the most conservative route out of love and often your friends as well. So you have to decide your own tolerance for risk and recognize that often in life, there's a direct relationship between risk and return. And if you're willing to take on more risk, then um, you're, you're doing so because you're hoping for that larger return. Yep. Uh, so that's a very personal decision. It is. And you just reminded me of an excellent quote. Uh, it's usually, it's misattributed to Winston Churchill. I, I don't know who exactly said it, um, but it's however beautiful the strategy, you should occasionally look at the results. Um, which is essentially meaning, is the person who's giving you the advice or trying to deter you from taking a certain path, are they living the life that you want and doing what you want to do? If not, take a step back and consider how what they're saying actually plays into your life and what you want to do with it. Great point. Yep, absolutely. So I wanted to maybe completely change topics. And the one last question I had is I feel like I've somebody told me a long time ago, um, I, I don't forget if it was like Stripe or, or some like really famous um, startup. They started by like literally they just had like a homepage and then everything else was done manually. So what do you advise people on um, like how do they decide if they have this like big, huge idea what to automate and what to just perform manually as they're you know, increasing customers and things like that and get more money? It's a fantastic question. Um, I don't know. Um, <laughs> Cause, cause I, I'm pretty sure, like, I could be wrong, but I, I would guess like 60% of me would guess that it was like, somebody said Stripe, like when they first started, it was like just a homepage and they literally had somebody like available 24 seven, just like collecting payments. That's very possible. I mean, you can start, you can do it in a number of different ways. I mean, that's, a, a big piece of advice, speaking to what you're saying, is not to to overinvest in the first version. Um, so, like, you build an MVP first, and that MVP could be literally, like you're saying, a person sitting in a room somewhere with a spreadsheet, kind of keeping track of things, um, which you can do. But um, can, you, can you ask me the question one more time? I want to make sure I respond to it properly. Yeah. So, you know, say, you know, your application is like a little bit more complex and it's, you know, you have like multiple things going on and, um, you know, you might not have the ability to automate every single thing in that application. So, um, I'm just curious, like, do you have a thought process that you go by on, you know, what to actually build out that's automated versus like what to just continue doing manually? Yes. Well, Man, like, that's a good question. <laughs> like maybe you have like, I don't, yeah, I don't know. Like, com I'll let you answer. <laughs> I mean, what it comes down to for, and this is speaking personally for my own, my own motivations and how I want people to perceive my own business, uh, which is only automate up to the point where you're not going to lose the human touch. So for example, every customer that signs up for, our, for our mentorship, I, you know, write them a handwritten letter and mail it out to them. Um, stuff like that shouldn't really be removed. You don't want to try and automate everything unless that's really your goal. Like if you're happy, you know, just running like this kind of faceless corporation or something like that, go nuts. But I think it's it's a judgment call. You got to say like, well, what do I want this to be perceived like? Because and that's going to ultimately dictate what you automate and what you don't. 
Because if it's, uh, well, I don't really care how people think about my marketing, well, then you just automate your marketing emails. You know, maybe you write some drip campaigns or something like that, and then there you go. But if you care that people are going to be reading that, you want them to know that you're accessible for whatever. Uh, I guess, like, again, it depends on the context. But then you're you're going to lean toward, well, I'm going to write these by hand myself or I'm going to respond to every email myself. It's it's totally contextual based on how you want what you're doing to be perceived. There's a really terrific book that I read last year uh, called Procrastinate on Purpose by Rory Vaden. And he has five steps essentially that you take. Um, and the first one's eliminate. So you you basically you you wipe out anything that you don't have to do right. So what's the minimum thing that I have to do in order for my business to operate? And then you automate uh, the parts of it that are going to save you a bunch of time and effort. And then you delegate the things that you know you can afford to and have you know. But but each of these steps take time. So you spend you're going to spend some of the time doing the stuff. He calls that concentrate. They all end at eight, right? And then anything that you can put off, then you put it off till later. And then you come back and maybe you eliminate it later or automate it later or delegate it later. But uh, anyway, what that does is it allows you to make the things that matter a priority. And then you can slowly but surely eliminate some of the things that you have to do um, on a regular basis or that have to take up some of your attention because you're either not going to do them or you're going to automate them or you're going to find somebody else to do them. And you just work your way through this cycle again and again and again. Um, so, uh, one thing that I, I've talked to a few people that have started businesses and they had this big grand plan, but they started with the very simplest case. And by doing that, they were able to focus on the parts that mattered and then automate those. And then they could bring more things in because they had more time to prioritize the other stuff. You know, there's a couple of interesting stories about startup companies. For example, I heard that the way that Redbox started was that they actually hired an intern that sat inside that big red box and was manually grabbing the DVDs and handing them out when people were ordering them. Lord, I hope that's true. <laughs> Isn't that <laughs> awesome? But they were testing out as to whether or not people would want to buy in the box rather than trying to build some big thing with all this machinery, which would be complex. They, it was what they decided was the best way to go about giving it a test. And um, again, DHH, a uh, super smart guy, uh, wrote an interesting blog post recently. I think it was, it, it was, I don't know if it was him or somebody from his same company, but they wrote a blog post called uh, Do Things That Don't Scale. And he's just basically talking about when you start up your business, do things that you can't uh, easily automate right now so you can figure out how your business should run and then mm -hmm. work on scaling things. But like talk to every customer right up front. Obviously the guy who started, the founder of the company is going to talk to every customer and deal with every customer complaint in the long term, but for right now you can. And so uh, he talked about some interesting stuff like that. I thought that was always all good advice. Yeah. And if you're curious about David, uh, we interviewed him for Ruby Rogues. That comes out the day after Christmas. So it's been out a few weeks by the time this one comes out. Cool. But yeah, that that's true as well, because you don't want to automate the wrong thing, right? Right. And so, yeah, if, if you're going through that process, you figure out the parts that matter because people are saying, I love that you deliver to my house but I really don't need these other services that you seem to think I need. Right. Yeah, there's a good example in the book, uh, Lean Startup, that talks about standing up a, a website to sell uh, French sailor shirts. And uh, he didn't actually have any shirts in stock at all. He just placed ads. And then when people filled out the information at a given price, tried to purchase it, he said, sorry, we're all out of stock right now, but I'll contact you. And in that way, he was able to figure out whether ordering the shirts would actually turn him a profit uh, and at what point price point people were willing to accept. Now, there are, of course, some potential ethical implications to what he's described there, uh, which you have to reason about on your own. But it is a good point of make a hypothesis and then uh, come up with a way to uh, prove it. Yep. So I'm curious, Ryan, if people engage you, you know, they come and they're like, look, I'm trying to do this startup. I'm kind of stuck, you know, clever beagle. You're going to fix my life. Um, you know, what, what does an hmm. engagement like that look like? Right. You know, how are, are you working with them for like an hour a week or is it as much or as little as they need? Do you sit down and make a plan first and then work through that? What, what, what's kind of your approach there? So the, the entire relationship is based on 
two hour appointments once a week. Okay. So we'll sit down with you. And the, the way that we start everything out is we, we give you a process that you can follow. So one of the big places that a lot of people get stuck is they get overwhelmed. So they have all these ideas. They, they kind of know how to implement it. Maybe they don't. But what we do is we focus like, okay, let's get all of the ideas down or as much as we can. Usually we just get a little bit of the idea mapped out. But uh, the way that we work is we, we have a, a custom issue tracker that we use with all of our customers. And we sit down and we say, okay, well, let's plan out all of the, the features that are going to go into this. And we just start with the high level stuff. And then we, we pick the thing that sounds most interesting from there uh, and start to build. Uh, and then each week we, make, we either make progress toward whatever that feature was that we had started on. Um, or we just keep, you know, kind of combing through the list until we get to what we think is a, a stable product or what fulfills the original vision for the product, I should say. Um, yeah, it's actually, it's, it sounds simpler when I say it. Um, but that's, that's how we do it. Awesome. I could talk about this all day. I've been trying not to ask all the questions. And so I'm glad everybody else chimed in. <laughs> so, so, uh, one last question that I have is, so let's say that somebody thinks, okay, I want to go out, I want to start a business, I have this idea, what is the next big thing that they have to do? Start. Um, write the first line of code. Talk to the first person you think might want to use it. Um, sit down and sketch out the interface. Do whatever you can to just push it forward a little bit. Um, and then keep doing that. And get yourself into a habit of just showing up and doing the work until you get yourself moving. Uh, and there's, there's no guarantee that that's going to work. But the number one thing that I see a lot of people screw up is that they, they get a really, you know, powerful start. They're like, yeah, I'm into this. I'm going to do this. And then once they get into the thick of it, they quit. And that's when you really got to lay your foot down on the pedal and just say, like, nope, I'm going to commit to this and I'm going to do it. So you got to just start. Don't spin your tires. Don't just think like, oh, well, I wonder if what it would be like if I started a business. Just go do it. Mm -hmm. Don't worry about what happens. All right. Well, we went a little longer than we normally do, so I'm going to push us to picks. For you, the listeners of JavaScript Jabber, Loot Crate is offering an opportunity to save 10% on any new subscription at LootCrate.com. Just enter the promo code BRIDGE10 for 10% savings. Loot Crate is one of my favorite things. Every month I get a box in the mail, costs less than $20, and it comes with all kinds of goodies. I have stuff from just looking at my shelf, Batman, Spider-Man, Ninja Turtles, Back to the Future, Lord of the Rings, Star Wars, and much, much more. So if you're a geek, a gamer, anything like that, and you want cool stuff to put around your office, cool t-shirts, comic books, etc., then definitely check out Loot Crate. To save 10% on your new subscription, go to lootcrate.com slash ruby. Again, that's lootcrate.com slash ruby to save 10% on any new subscription. Enter the promo code BRIDGE10 for 10% savings. Amy, do you have some picks for us? Sure. So I'm going to go with the video that I posted uh, when we were talking earlier, just the privilege video. And then the other one is a really short article, but uh, I really like the point that the article is making. It's called Spaghetti Code MVP Epidemic. Uh, so I will put a link to that in the show notes. And that's it for me. All right, Joe, what are your picks? All right, so I'm being a little bit inspired by this episode. I talked a little bit about a couple of things that I'd read in this pretty amazing book. I'm sure I picked it before, but it's called Everybody Lies, and it's all really about big data, but it's talking about just a bunch of different really interesting stuff. So I'll pick that. I'll also pick, which is pretty topical to today, uh, Seth Godin. He's written quite a few different books, and he has a, a lot big blog series just writes about uh, a lot of related topics to what we had today. So Seth Godin. And then finally, last night, I took my uh, very elderly father to see the movie Murder on the Orient Express. It was actually the second time I've seen the movie. I went and saw it when it first came out. And the second time I saw it, I was actually even more entranced with the movie than the first time I saw it. It was even better, which I really liked it the first time, but it was even better the second time. Such a great movie. So uh, that'll be my final pick. Nice. Corey, what are your picks? So I'm going to focus on two audiobooks that uh, 
I really enjoyed. Uh, the first is the power of moments, uh, why certain experiences have extraordinary impact. Uh, I love this book because of what it really emphasizes is that we have the control over our lives to create moments and that um, when you look back over your life, it's those special moments that you remember, not the minutia of the day to day. And and that uh, also as somebody that's an entrepreneur, you have to think about how can I create moments for my customers? How can I do something special, something remarkable? Um, so a really good book uh, with a lot of actionable material in it. Uh, the other one, which I alluded to earlier, is uh, The 50th Law, which is effectively the biography of the rapper 50 Cent, but it is uh, written uh, pro- It's written by someone else who interviewed him and is sharing pieces, but 50 Cent in the audiobook uh, speaks at points in there. So it makes it really engaging because he's got this special voice and way of speaking that uh, uh, really an interesting book uh, about conquering your fears and um, stepping out and also uh, an interesting conversation around privilege because he was most certainly not privileged, but fought his way through and he talks about how he did it. Uh, so those are my two picks. Nice. Uh, I'm going to chime in here with a few picks. Um, I'm going to be a little bit self-serving here. Um, putting together the React and View podcasts. I'm also doing one on Elixir. So we'll put links to those in the show notes just so you can go support them because I've set up Indiegogo's to kind of cover the production costs for the first few months. Um, and then um, you can also support the shows through Patreon if you want. Um, I'm also pulling together a React Dev Summit, and that's going to be February 26th through March 2nd. Um, it's going to be online. You can watch the talks live for free. So go check that out. And then I'm also going to be showing up on a few podcasts coming up. And so I thought I'd shout out about those as well. One is the IT Career Energizer podcast. Um, and we just talk about having a career and, you know, kind of what my journey was a little bit. It, it, it's rather short. So I tell some stories, but I don't go into great detail about some areas of my career. Um, but Anyway, really, really interesting. And then the other show that I'm going to be going on is .NET Rocks. So if you've been listening to programming podcasts for a while, um, Carl and Richard have been uh, producing the show. I think Carl's been doing it since like 2005. So it's like 12 years old. It's like a freaking forever old podcast. Um, But they're great guys. Uh, Wind up seeing them a couple times a year at Microsoft events. And, uh, you know, I've had some pretty interesting conversations with them. But yeah, we're going to be talking about finding a job and what what it takes um, and the course that I've been putting together for that. Um, I've been recording the sessions live and I've had some people uh, sit in and watch them. So um, anyway, uh, interesting stuff uh, there if you're interested in that. And I'll put links to those episodes when they come out in the show notes. Um, Ryan, what are your picks? Mm-hmm. I'm going to keep it, keep it contextual to what we've been talking about today. And I want to share a few books. Um, that really helped to uh, light the fire under me and get me going the past few years. Um, and the first, it's it's a series of three, you kind of call it a series, um, but they're all by the same author. His name's Stephen Pressfield. Um, and it's Turning Pro, The War of Art, and Do the Work. And all three are about unsticking yourself from kind of the, the mental blocks that you feel like you get when you're trying to be creative and trying to produce something. Um, And he basically explains to you why all that stuff is make believe that like writer's block doesn't exist. Any creative block doesn't exist. It's all in your head. Um, And those three books that was I honestly can point to that as the point in time when I really started to get my stuff together and start um, getting getting a lot better at this stuff. Um, And the second is another series um, by an unexpected person. Um, There's a guy named Ari Weinswag and he runs a deli out of Ann Arbor, Michigan called Zingerman's. And he has written a fantastic book series um, called Elapsed Anarchist Guide uh, to Good Leading. Um, and there's there's four books in the series. There's one on uh, building a great business, uh, being a better leader, uh, managing yourself and how that has an impact on your business. And then the fourth one is uh, the power of beliefs in business. And all four of them are absolutely fantastic. Uh, and have a major impact on how I do stuff. Awesome. I love the Pressfield books. Those are terrific. Yeah, totally agree. They're awesome. Yep. 
All right. Well, uh, if people want to follow you on Twitter or GitHub, see what you're doing with Meteor or hire you to help them start a business, where do they go? Um, so you'll always find me ranting personally at uh, Twitter at R Glover. Um, but then on the business side of things, the best place to head for uh, Clever Beagle related stuff, just go to cleverbeagle.com slash subscribe. And that's got links to our to sign up for our mailing list, Twitter, Facebook, literally everything. So you'll you'll find us the best way there. Awesome. Well, thanks for coming and uh, sparking some interesting and at points somewhat heated conversation. Yes. <laughs> well, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. All right. Well, we'll wrap this one up and we'll catch everyone next week. Bandwidth for this segment is provided by Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN. Deliver your content fast with Cashfly. Visit C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com to learn more.